What's up, guys, and welcome to the Music Hacks Network. I am Chris Bailey. If you're on this program for the first time, make sure you smash that subscribe icon. Yes, man, subscribe to the Music Hacks Network because these are the great, great, great information that we're going to bring you uh, for the rest of the year and beyond. Help us to grow. Make sure you hit that like icon as well make this video go viral i am looking for a thousand likes on this video all right uh, we have some of the students from the humber college uh, they were invited by by mr duane livingston and you know duane is not a stranger to the music hacks network so what we're going to do, we're going to invite these guys and these guys are so, so talented. All right. I had a chance of doing a sound check with them and my, my, I was, I was totally amazed with the level of their skills. All right. So we're going to bring them over now. What's up guys. Welcome to the music hacks network. Thank yeah, you. Thank you for having us. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. I, I, I was just telling the guys on YouTube and also on Zoom that you guys are very skilled at your, your instrument and they are in for a great time this afternoon on the Music Hacks Network. The only thing that I am a little bit disappointed for is that um, in the virtual world, we are not able to, to connect our instrument in time so that we can have a, a live setting. But that was the main idea when I spoke to Duane. Um, I wanted you guys to be in one place, but I understand that you guys are off for the holidays. Um, Duane, what I'm gonna ask you to do, um, since you know the guys more than I do, I'm gonna ask you just to uh, tell me about these guys and then we're gonna hear from them individually. All right. Well, I think I should start with telling you how I met them. So Gabriel and Matt, <laughs> are both in my year so when I went to school um, and I saw I started a jam the first band I started jamming with Gabriel was a drummer mm -hmm. Gabriel in Suho Suho is a guitarist from um, Korea South Korea and we, used to be, we had a band like that man the guy was just was ridiculous with time his, his musicianship and his, <laughs> let me tell you something else I mean he's he, he, he has his own studio he does he plays mm. bass he plays guitar plays does his own recording of rock songs and he, he writes songs like i wish I, one day i hope i will be able to write songs like that so he's, i'm telling you and, and it's not flattery it's true the guy is ridiculous man he's amazing <laughs> an amazing person as well um, um Dwayne, can, can you give us some more volume on your, your microphone or sure, pull the mic sure. closer to you uh, maybe yeah maybe that's what it is is that better? Yes. That's better. Okay. All right. Yes. Yeah, so I hope I, I hope you heard all about all of, all the accolades I just give about Gabriel. Mm -hmm. My guy is yeah. <laughs> and then Matt. <laughs> Matt um, Matt was in improv class. I I remember walked into improv class. That the first improv class I went to, he was there on guitar. And I. The guy had me, my, I, that was when I decided to never play guitar again. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well that's Yo, man. <laughs> so I'm going to put guitar down for a while because this guy is, this guy makes me look like a disgrace, man. And <laughs> yeah, and he's, the guy is just ridiculous and his, his, his vocabulary musically is, is unmatched. <laughs> and so I, he, both of my recitals, I think. Yeah, both of my recitals. All of my recitals. Matt was my guitarist. Gabriel was my drummer for all my recitals. And and I had a saxophonist, Elik. Elik Sor. I, I can't call his last name. He's from Israel. But he's Soror. Soror, I think. S-R-O-R. Yeah, he was my saxophonist for the first recital. And then I... For my final recital, I needed a saxophone player. And my teacher, Mike Downs, and, um, said to me, Why don't you try Lucas Dubovic? And let me tell you something. Whoa. If, uh, these guys know Mike Downs. Mike Downs is the truth, right? This guy is a serious monster of music. Upright, electric, <laughs> piano. It's ridiculous, right? And he said, um, try Lucas Dubovic. He said, Lucas Dubovic is, ver Dubovic is very good. And that that's all I needed to hear, man. Because I knew it was going to be 
something else. When the guy right. came into my first rehearsal, he wasn't even so acquainted with the music. It was just a paper. <laughs> mm-hmm. Chris, I tell you, that was a day, man. It's, it's these guys are off the charts in terms of the vocabulary. Yeah. Vocabulary musically. And um, they're all great people um, beyond the skill. And that's, that's, that's like, it's more like an awesome, man. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Dwayne. All right, guys. So we, we heard from Dwayne who, um, actually invited you guys here now so uh what we want to do now is to get a, a brief introduction from each of you all right Dwayne can tell us so much and no more what we want to hear from you guys who you are and let us start with Gabriel oh thanks Chris uh yeah I just want to say thanks for having me thank you Dwayne for the the kind words this guy is one of the most humble guys I've ever met and one of the greatest musicians too just Playing with him, Matt Lucas, it's just like, oh my, like, I got to go home and practice some more just to like, just to get up to their level. Like it's, they're, they're just crazy good. <laughs> so, yeah, Just a little bit about me. Uh, I'm born and raised in uh, Hamilton, Ontario. I started playing drums when I was five years old from uh, a great drum teacher, Brian Dorner. A lot of influence in like rock music and all that stuff. And then uh, I went to uh, LA for about a year to study there and really opened up the door to just a whole bunch of different genres, like Latin, funk, and, and fusion, jazz, all that stuff. And then went to Humber, where I met these guys, and just even opened the door even further, just such great teachers there and faculty, and really helped me to develop as a musician and as a person. Mm-hmm. Awesome, awesome, Gabriel. All right, let's see, Matt. All right, uh, yeah, thanks so much for having me, and thanks, Dwayne, you're too kind. <laughs> um, so I'm actually, I'm not from Canada. I'm, I grew up in Harare, Zimbabwe, Southern Africa, but I'm studying here in Toronto. And yeah, in the same way, year as Dwayne. And yeah, we met in improv class and uh, my first impression of hearing Dwayne play was like, who is this bassist that can pump <laughs> chords better than the guitar players and the piano <laughs> players and play lines faster than the sax players? I'm like, what's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I'm going into my last year of Humber this coming fall. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and that's about it for now. <laughs> okay, awesome. Awesome, Matt. All right, let's have Lucas. Yeah, uh, great. I mean, uh, there's so much I can say about these wonderful musicians I'm with today. Uh, Dwayne, my man, you speak so highly of me, but I remember that I'm sharing the stage with you. <laughs> Master bass player, <laughs> you got all the taste and you... Man, I think you can play faster than I can, and I play a saxophone, so <laughs> certainly scary. Um, yeah, uh, as soon as I met these guys, it was quite the lock. It, easy to play with. They're very creative. They all have a very strong voice on their instrument. Um, mm-hmm. I guess to talk about myself, I'm originally from Vancouver, British Columbia in Canada, and uh, I just finished my four years at Humber College, and... That's uh, all there is to it right now. I love the saxophone and happy to share some music with you all today. Awesome. Awesome, guys. Welcome again to the Music Hacks Network. We also have some visitors on Zoom that I'm going to acknowledge uh, before the Q&A. All right. Some of your friends, they are here to hear you guys play on the Music Hacks Network. All right. But um, normally what we do on the network, we normally do an interview. But this one, I am going to uh, sort of forego a little and have you guys play more than we we talk, all right? But I just want to hear from you guys. um, How did you get started in playing music and at what age? Or we can take uh, Gabriel first. Sure. sure. For me, uh, I started with uh, like my family choir at church. I was like singing in the choir before I could even read. I would have to memorize all the songs and and then from there just my sister was into music as well and my parents uh played some music in high school and and still play a little bit of music now and so they just kind of really inspired me and gave me the many opportunities to take lessons and just just inspire a great uh lot of creativity at home and yeah really appreciative of that Mm -hmm. all right matt yeah so uh, i started I started um, piano lessons when I must have been like six or seven and I sucked. I was just about tone deaf and 
couldn't really get the hang of it at all. Um, but then when I was like 11 or 12 years old, I picked up the drums and it started to actually click and I got really into it. And then, I'm not sure exactly what happened, but at some point I just felt like I really wanted to learn guitar. So I was about, I think, 13 or 14 when I sort of switched instruments and just kind of dove in on guitar and I've been playing a lot ever since. <laughs> But it sort of mm -hmm. came out of nowhere because I, I definitely wasn't uh, musically inclined as a young kid. Awesome. So, Lucas. Uh... Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I had the privilege of starting early. My grandmother was a concert pianist and she really wanted me to learn piano. So I started when I was three. Uh, the issue with that was uh, mm -hmm. because I started so early. I thought I didn't like it, and I'm really sad about it now that I didn't continue, but uh, my parents, the way they were, they, they said they wouldn't let me quit music, I have to do something, which I'm very thankful for, and um, so I wasn't allowed to quit piano. The only way I could get out is if I picked up another instrument, so I, I was listening to some some of the great black American masters, Dexter Gordon, uh, Coleman Hawkins, and I'd say, what, what instrument's that? I want to play that, so mm -hmm. I started playing about close to 10 years ago and I haven't looked back. I just wish I kept with the piano, so. Awesome, awesome. Um, Duane, we have a whole full length interview with you on the Music Hacks Network. And guys, those persons who did not see that interview of Duane Livingston, make sure you go to YouTube and search for Duane's interview. So what I wanted to do, Duane, you're gonna tell us a little bit more about Humber college and actually how did you end up at Humber? Okay, that's a, that's a good question and I, I like that one. Um, well, let me talk first about how I ended up there. I, I always wanted to go to, when I was in Jamaica after spending, after finishing Edna Manley College and doing some time in the professional field, I, I wanted to go further my studies. I used to be checking mm -hmm. out the Berkeley College of Music because that's popular, you know, everybody knows, knew, knew about Berkeley and Maurice Gardner, a teacher. Was right. Yeah, you, you can go to Berkeley, but Berkeley is very expensive. And then mm. another teacher came to Edna Money College. Um, Anne McNamee. She, uh, she Miss McNamee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. And she said, you know, you could try Humber College. It's, it's, it's just as good as Berkeley. And it's way cheaper. And so I heard that. And, you know, I was like... Uh, I was, okay, let me go check out the two colleges. My mm -hmm. brother-in-law is a musician as well. He's a bass player, Nigel. You right. may know him too, Chris. Nigel. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah man. So, um, he, was, he, he was checking out the colleges as well. And he told me about Humber. He said, he said, Dwayne, you need to see these guys, man. You need to see Humber, Humber College. So, we, what we did was we juxtaposed Humber beside Berkeley. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, it, immediately I knew it was Humber I'm going to study. <laughs> Okay. I'm going to study, <laughs> you know, and um, it was still financially, it was still kind of out of reach. But you know, at some point, you realize that if you don't really take that first step, it's not going to happen. I, I guess that mm -hmm. was what happened in 2019. I just decided, you know what, let's check out how to get into Humber, and I saw the requirements where you have to do um, a statement. Of, was it? No, it's not statement of intent. It's what's it called again? I mean, I think that was what it was. But and. Um, an audition tape and a theory test and I sent the audition tape the theory test and did all those things and was waiting and I was wondering I wonder if I'm going to get in and I saw a message from Mike Downs um, saying doing I sent off your accept the acceptance to the registry and I gave you a scholarship as well and I'm telling you I couldn't even read oh. the message I just sent it to my wife and and my sister said tell me, tell me what did that, that tell me what that email said <laughs> I couldn't read it. <laughs> yeah, um, and uh, that's how I got in. And then lots of things happened between that. And I packed up, went to Humber. So let's talk about Humber now. When I got here, Chris, let me tell you something, man. If everybody listening, if, when almost everybody you walk past at Humber is a monster musician, even if they don't look like it. Monsters, I'm telling you. The teachers at Humber are out of this world good. I'm saying it. Mm. What I'm saying here is not really doing justice to them, I'm telling you. My teacher, Mike Downs, 
he's in well at least he was in charge of the degree program and I was in um when I just got there in third year. I don't know if it's but Mike Downs, Patrick Kilbride, go check out those guys. Pat Kilbride, one of the best bass players in the world, not just in Canada. Rich Brown. Um Lucas Well, see these guys right here? But I guess Jamaica and the rest of the people listening will get a chance to hear what these people are. I won't need I won't need to talk about them, you'll hear them. But I am just telling you about the Definitely. teachers there are ridiculous. Mm. They're out of this world good. Lucian Gray, um Amanda Tosoff who taught me theory. And I'm telling you, don't don't be fooled, man. She she goes around that piano, it's a monster. Yeah. It's, the college is mm -hmm. just uh one of the things I like about the school is that um the people are very kind here, you know. And um you do, you will never they're not the hype is there's no hype. It's like these people are so good at what they do and they're just they're so they're just so calm about it, man. I like that, you know. Awesome, awesome. All right guys, there you have it from Dwayne. So if you cannot get into Berkeley, all right, then there is another college in Canada <laughs> that is just as equally good. Humber. And I'm, and I'm recommending it, yeah. I trust Awesome. You. And there you go. If Duane recommends it, then definitely. Right? <laughs> it's one of the top colleges that we can try. All right, guys. What I want to do now, we're going to go into a little bit more interactive discussion. So I want everybody to be in on this discussion. All right? Now, um, you guys have actually played together. Yeah. Right? Right? You said you have been in jam sessions and recitals. All right? How, how do you sort of prepare yourselves for these recitals at... Humber, I, wa I want all of you to tell us. Yeah, let me start you because since they, since they played for mine, so let me talk. Let all right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> these guys knew I I played in a lot of recitals here, right? And one recital outside of yours is a mm -hmm. hell of a lot because you have to think about rehearsals. I played for Gabriel's, and let me tell you, like I said, the guy is a phenomenal writer of music and arranger as well, and putting um, the show together with Gabriel. I was the bass player there. I have to learn the songs and come to the rehearsal and know all the parts and those things, you know. And one of the, one of the things that goes into the preparation for these things is that you have to have your charts. You must have your charts. And the teachers want your charts and you have to do them to your band members. At least a lead sheet for them to know what is going to be played where and when. It's not like it's not it's not a jam session so much. It's you know you understand what I'm saying. Um, for my final recital, that was what it was. And the, the other thing about it is that we have to do a lot of original material, especially for the final recital. I think it was seventy percent of what we played had to be original. So these Whoa. guys know my song even before the release. Mm -hmm. These are the guys who are going to do my EP for next year. So my <laughs> album is coming out. These are the guys who are going to be on it. Um, mm. You're going to hear what I'm talking about, and and trust me, you you won't. I'm uh, the only. My only regret is that I won't get to um, have them play. Have us play together as a unit tonight. If mm. if we could do that, maybe I would even do um, do one of my original songs. I, I, people in Jamaica may have heard me play this song before. Well, I, I think I think you and you and um, Gabriel, yeah. I, I, there was there was a little bit of um, chemistry between both of you. Um, yeah. Let us try just just to try and say, Gabriel, yeah. can, can you you pick up that beat? <laughs> Let's try. The the one we were doing before, Dwayne, yeah. Yeah.
Amazing stuff, amazing stuff. Uh, greater things are yet to come, all right, as we proceed in this show, all right? So let us take, um, I want to hear your interpretation of that, Matt. Just for a minute, on that tune. Right, what would you play tune. with these guys? Sure. All right, yeah. yeah. All right, one second. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yep, I can hear
Yes, sir. <laughs> definitely, definitely. That was great, man. Great, great. I would definitely ask you to break down that in the next couple of minutes. All right? Sure, sure. Let's say Lucas, Livy. Yeah. Oh, man. This, these guys are, you know, phenomenal. Oh, <laughs> Let's say Lucas. Sure, I'll give it a shot here. <laughs> yeah. Can you hear me okay? Okay. That's fine. to do um i'm gonna ask you to break down this this composition i wanted to dissect it all right i know there are a lot of persons who actually don't understand some of the the, the movements all right and stuff like that i want you guys to turn on your your microphones and you're going to tell us about this composition break it down so that the normal musician like myself can understand what was going on All right. So, um, if anyone doesn't know, I mean that's a, a jazz standard called "Have You Met Miss Jones," and basically the, we all just play it over the same song form, so the same structure, number of bars, and underlying chord changes. Although I think we were each kind of superimposing a few other extra ones in as we went, <laughs> but the actual harmonic movement of the song is pretty simple for the most part. Um, but what's great about it is there's a lot of room for you to embellish and make yeah. it as complex as your sort of language on the instrument, you know, yeah. whatever suits like your level of playing. But essentially the, the A section, which is most of the tune, because there are three A sections and one B section. So three quarters of the tune is essentially on uh, like a one, six, two, five progression, which is pretty simple. Like if we're an F, that'd be like F, D, G minor C like which is pretty familiar but then there are all sorts of other little extra movements you can throw in there to make it more interesting like for instance replacing that 2 5 at the end which is G minor and C7 with two back to back 2 5s crammed in so like a half step up and then that one like A flat D flat G C like so in context, that'd be like... And 
So there are all kinds of little things like that that you can throw in. So it, it might sound like there are a lot of chords going on, but the underlying structure that we're following is pretty, pretty simple. Except for the B section, that's got some, <laughs> got some chords in it. <laughs> all right. Anybody else? Yeah, just to uh, touch on what Matt was saying. So yeah, this is a song that we're all familiar with. Uh, a lot of uh, musicians will be familiar with as well. It's from the Great American Songbook, written by Richard Rogers. And uh, this is something common that I guess uh, here or through music school, uh, people would call it jam sessions. And uh, like Matt's saying, it's it's somewhat simple, but it's up to the musician whether they want to make it hard for themselves. Uh, but it all comes down to taste. I mean. Matt had a very beautiful version and that's partially because of his voice and how he hears how he creates and carves his melody. I played a little differently and also I have to um, understand that my instrument is uh, in mono. Like I, I can't comp or play chords for myself so I have to navigate it different than Matt would. And I'm sure if we all played it singularly, even Gabriel on the drums, we'd all have a very different interpretation of the same song. But uh, yeah, otherwise Matt covered most of it so... Thanks to you. Yep. <laughs> All right. It, uh, uh, what and that's pretty much what Matt just said a while ago. Is uh, I because I figured I was going to get this question tonight anyway. You know, um, <laughs> you may, I, in, in, especially in the improvisational stage. You know, um, you're tr you're actually playing what's there and what could be there. That's what makes this makes the solo interesting. You know, what what else could be there? And you do that in the solo, you, you, uh, you know. When you go to that two, you can go to a five, you can go. That takes you back home, right? It's, it's like, instead of going to the five. And that's what makes the solo interesting, you know? Um, so, so a lot mm. of those things that they were doing there, you know, a lot of uh, playing what's there and what could be there and some things that could be there, you know, there are, there are things that, that are there, things that could be there and there are things that could be there and those, these guys are out there, yeah. All right, all right, let, let's hear from Gabriel, the time master. Oh, yeah, no, I was just going to say, yeah, <laughs> not, not too much to add, like these guys like played it beautifully and like as they were saying, like everybody's got a different voice and different interpretations. Like when me and Dwayne were playing it, like we we're kind of, mm -hmm. I don't know how much it translated if the timing was a little bit off, but uh, we we're kind of going for like almost like a reggae kind of funk feel there. And I love to do that with songs, mm -hmm. you know, give it a, a Latin feel or a funk feel or you, because we were playing it swung, you could even put it straight too. And, and that'll just change the whole feel of it, which is, which is something else that's really cool. All right. All right, um, guys, I, I have to ask you this because um, this is one of the major problems I am having myself. Um, well, my favorite genre is reggae. You know that. Dwayne knows that. That's, that's in our blood. We cannot avoid um, the reggae. But I also love jazz dearly. All right? But one of the, the, the main problems that I have is to keep um, my place, right, once the chorus are going by. I think that's, that's one of my, my greatest challenges. How, what would you say to somebody like, like me who is having that sort of challenge? How do I overcome this hurdle? What do you mean? Like keeping up, keeping up the tempo? Keeping what, once, for example, I'm, I'm taking like a solo or whatever. How do I keep the chords going over in my head that I, do, that I do not lose my place? Yeah, a lot of people ask me that question when I was, when I, I was teaching bass in Jamaica. And it's a very, uh, I guess you'll have to, kind of let me tell you what I used to do at the fundamental levels I used to like uh, play a song sing the bass line and this oh, and my teacher here too Mike Downs this is one of the exercises he gave us you know that we should be able to sing the bass line or, or play the bass line and sing the song So the song is going on in your head. Um, you can mm -hmm. also, um, but this is harder, it, um, sing the bass line while you play the melody, you know. 
so bang boom. Sorry, but you know, that would burst my head, living man. That that that's that's extremely difficult. <laughs> no, no, but but the, the idea is after doing all of these exercises, you know where you are. You are in the song, even yeah, when you're playing, because that's that's a key. The, being able right. to solo, um, so you start soloing. Mm. Bang, three, four. It's like you you, you 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 stay ahead of, it's like the music is going on in your head while while mm. what's going on so click, click, click. and one other one key thing you can do to um deal with that too is to practice with a metronome so it mm -hmm. keeps you it keeps up one two three four one two three four one. once a click is going on it's like it kind of keeps your focus on where the song is going yeah awesome all right anybody was want, want to jump in and, and <laughs> take that I could add something i think um like i agree with everything Dwayne said like approaching the song from lots of angles really helps like i think some people are more intuitively like melody guys and some people are more like harmony like in terms of what comes naturally to you so for me as someone uh chord changes and harmony comes a lot easier to me so i find what really improved my sense of form the most is anchoring myself on the melody and really trying to make sure i know the melody well and being able to hear that in my head. So when I'm when we're playing, I'm not necessarily thinking like F7, D7, G minor. I'm just sort of thinking like bam, ba -dum, ba -dum, bam, and I'm playing whatever else, but oh. I'm just trying to hear the melody in my head um, and use that to anchor me because I mm -hmm. kind of know the harmony can take care of itself, but kind of because I've spent mm -hmm. a fair amount of time with harmony and voicings. And the other thing is just... Um, I think there's different levels of familiarity like we can kind of trick ourselves into thinking that we know something but we only kind of know it and then you find out whether you really really know it when you're playing it with people and you're getting kind of lost and you're like okay I, I kind of knew it enough to get through one chorus but like maybe I don't know it that well so some of the best advice I ever heard was like don't practice something until you get it right practice it until you can't get it wrong and that's mm -hmm. I guess sums it up for me like knowing it on a really deep level as opposed to just kind of remembering it. <laughs> All right. All right. Yep. Gabriel, what do you think, Gabriel? Yeah, I was going to say, like you said, if you get lost in the forum, that was, that was me for sure. Like when I started, you know, listening to jazz and, and playing along and what I found really helped was like they said, just Whoa. really internalizing the melody. This way you get it because, you know, when, when jazz, was new to me, you know, all the changes were new. So I just had to, you know, keep listening to different songs. And then eventually, you know, with with ear training and everything, you can kind of you hear the different sections. You hear, OK, this mm -hmm. is the section. This is the bridge. And you can just kind of tell with the chord changes where the song will go next. And yeah, just always kind of just internalizing that melody in my head really helps to to keep me mm -hmm. grounded and know where I am throughout the song. All right. Um, before you, before, Gabriel, I wanted to you know address um, swing. How do you swing those notes, bro? Oh man. Explain to us. I wish <laughs> it's just I'm still I'm always learning. Like there's so many greats that like just listening to like Elvin Jones, Philly Joe Jones, all these all these incredible drummers, just trying to listen to mm -hmm. them and it's like they say it's just a feel. Like you know, it's obviously that that triplet subdivision and you just kinda start there, but you just kinda hear how they play, like where they place their note how they even just, just swing their stick. There's just different, whole bunch of different ways. Like Elvin would kind of put the, uh, he would put the emphasis on the, uh, like the, uh, the A uh, of the triplet, I guess, or whatever, like right mm -hmm. going into the downbeat. That's, that was kind of known as his thing. And just, there's a whole bunch of different ways to do it. And like everybody's swing is, even though it's all playing the same pattern can all sound a little bit different. And yeah, there's, there's, there, you could just go so deep. I think it was Elvin or something, or Philly, somebody said, Somebody told him he's like it was 70, 80 years old. They're like, yeah, man, you're you're really like you're the you're the best at swing. He's like, yeah, I'll, I'll get there soon. And like 70, 80. So he's like, he's still learning. Like these guys know, like it's just an ongoing process all the time. Mm -hmm. Awesome, awesome. All right, all right. 
Lucas, you are the person who drives the, the, the melody um, most times in, in the band. All right, I wanted to tell us how do you approach, uh, you know, working the melody and sort of bringing a sort of improvisational concept to a tune. Right. Um, so to speak about melody, I guess, like Matt said, strictly just from the last topic, learning a song, uh, certain people learn the, the harmony and their changes first and other people's their melody. I'm definitely a melody person. Uh, if I'm trying to learn a song, I definitely am listening to it through my, my headphones all day, every day. I want to get sick of it. I want to love it. I'm trying to make sure I never forget it and I sing it along wherever I go, no matter how stupid I look. So <laughs> for starters, that's how I learned melody. But melody is an incredible, imp incredibly important thing. In, in my opinion, it's the most important thing. And it's the same way that I would try to approach improvisation and soloing is you're creating another melody just based off another set of, well, the same set of chord changes apart from the original melody, if that makes any sense. You're trying to sing. At least I'm trying to sing on my instrument in a way that is still tasteful and the technique and whatnot is more so fireworks excitement, but it's another way <laughs> to bring pieces of melody together. So I will say I think it's a very important piece of the entirety of music. There's a lot going on and how you lock in with the band. And I ch tend to play a melody exactly as it was played or written until I'm either very comfortable with it and then I can start to put pieces of myself into it. So a little bit of improvisation where I snake around the melody uh, apart from how it was originally written or played. But yeah, it's, it's a lifelong study. It's hard to deviate from the melody because either sometimes you feel that oh I'm playing too much only of the melody or sometimes you feel like oh I'm not playing enough of the melody but at the end of the day it's the most important thing and how you interpret it is very important so I try to, to play melody when I'm playing the melody I try to play melody when I'm improvising and even if I'm playing background lines I see that as melody and you have to sing every line you play at least that's how I see it on the saxophone awesome awesome guys all right, so what we're gonna do now, we're going to bring our audiences into the mix, all right? And normally at this point, we have what we call a Q and A, all right? But I actually know you guys have your individual pieces that you're actually gonna perform for us on the network, all right? So I'm gonna ask you to get ready for that. And I will, I will indicate um, randomly, all right? So make sure you guys are ready. All right, so we're gonna take some questions from YouTube and take some questions from Zoom. And then we're gonna ask you guys to play in between the Q and A. Is that cool? Yeah, that's All right. Cool. And yes, yes, Lucas. Oh, sorry, I just said, yeah, that sounds fantastic. Perfect. Awesome, awesome. And doing, you know you have to lead the charge, bro. You brought our friends here and definitely you have to lead the charge. So make sure you get uh, ready for your piece. All right, so let me welcome um, all the persons who are on Zoom with us. All right, I'm going to call your names. All right, we have Anne Marie Grant. We have Dr. Corinne Anderson, my friend. All right, we have Mr. Donald Waugh. We have Elizabeth Jackson. We have Lyndon. Uh, let me try to find the names. Novel Basie Myers. Robert, who is very active in the chat already. All right, we have Vaughn B and Lyndon McFarlane. Those are some of the guests on Zoom. Over YouTube, we have Jerome Finley, we have Kalisha McNamee, Lou Dixon, Oren Briscoe, Andre Goff, Rosalyn, Addison, Mark Manhurts. All right, we have Maxwell Prince. Going down the list, Mr. Delroy Thomas. All right, still going. We have Mr. Andre Campbell, the great pianist. All right, Afi Roots, big up self, Afi Roots. All right, so those are the persons who are tuning. I don't know a lot more persons are actually listening, but they are not in the, the chat. All right. 
All right. Yes, Robert. What Robert is saying, what do you need to do is not to overthink the music. All right. So let us, let us, Robert, do you want to be the first person to ask the question? Let's open up with Robert. You've been here for a while. Robert. Yeah, it's really good to be here, guys. And, you know, you guys are so amazing, man. It's just, it's just incredible. So, so the question that I just posed here is, uh, what do you need to do to not overthink music? Because I've come to realize that overthinking music can be to your detriment. It can lead to discouragement. What do you really need to do to not find yourself overthinking it? If I want to take that, I want to take uh, I can speak to that a little bit just off the top of my mind. It's something that's been very prevalent with me as well. It's it's hard to uh, get out of your head. I mean, I think the best thing I've ever heard was, especially coming from a jazz school where a lot of people are not necessarily as nice and, you know, you're really thinking about chord changes or what's the hippest thing or what's the coolest thing. Uh, the easiest way to, is to just let go of that and... Uh, realize that you can really play anything quite literally anything you're in full control of everything that will come out of your voice your instrument and that's how you present yourself i mean another uh really key thing at least for me is uh the musicians you see in front of you here gabriel uh Dwayne, matt i surrounded myself with people who are very open-minded i feel very comfortable taking risks uh, with certain musicians, people call things like, maybe we should try this, uh, this is really hard tune. To them, I might say no. To these musicians, I'd say, sure, let's try, because I feel comfortable taking leaps. So if you got uh, close friends who you know you play music with, definitely stick by their side. Matt Greenwood and I write together, we play together. Uh, I'm comfortable taking risks. And um, another part of that is just keep keep working hard at whatever it is that you do i'm not sure um what instrument you play or what you're trying to do but i encourage I you like to what, sorry I play what matt uh, matt plays i'm a lead guitarist as well eh? wonderful well so, I, so I really appreciate what matt does i mean because i'm watching him and it's like he's not doing nothing but look at the incredible sound that, that is coming from what he's doing you know he makes it look so simple so easy and and, and here i am I mean, for me, I mean, I, I really think hard about it and I'm like, wow. So, so that's a very important question coming from me. Yeah. In, in fact, I'm sure uh, Matt can feel it too, but I will say that Matt is also one of the best guitarists I know. He's played on all my, in all of my bands too. And he, he makes it look effortless, but I tell you, we'll be, we'll be workshopping things we've written together and we both agree it's the hardest thing we've ever played. So uh, Matt, do you have a few words to say? Yeah, I mean, I may not be the best person to answer that question because I think about music a lot. Like, I, I probably overthink things to a ridiculous extent. So I'm, I get kind of nerdy with my instrument and with music and theory and whatever. I just like to get into all the, the weeds and figure it all out as many different ways as I can. So, but definitely I will say that when I catch myself playing the best is when I notice I'm not thinking about it. So... I don't know if you figure out how not to overthink it. Uh, let me know, cause <laughs> it would be great. <laughs> but uh, still figuring it out. Um, but yeah, I actually like I, I tend to put a lot of time into figuring out the nitty gritty of what I'm doing and technique and chords, and I, I like to you know, get into the details, and I find it really fun to learn about. So. Oh, yeah. Appreciate it, guys. Really appreciate it. Awesome, awesome. All right, we're gonna take one more question. Um, the guys on YouTube, please, I'm gonna ask you to type your question in the chat so I can see them. All right, we have one from Kalisha. Um, guys, I don't know which one you wanna take this. How often do you guys practice? Wow. I mean, any one of these guys can answer that question, right? Answer, anyone can answer. Sure, I can hop in again quickly here. Uh, it, it depends. I mean, sometimes it's about passion, whether I really want to, I really want to play my instrument today, or sometimes it, it's, I want to put the TV on and work on my technique, and I'm upset about it, but you know I got to do it. So, 
I remember back in my first few years in college when I was taking it very well. I still take it very seriously. Don't get me wrong. But when I took practice to the next level, I was playing four to eight hours a day, every day. Uh, now more so, I try to put in one to two every day. I think the most important thing when it comes to practice is consistency. So whether you're doing your five, ten to fifteen minutes every day, that that speaks a lot to me because I, I can keep touching my instrument the familiarity grows with every day as opposed to doing one 10-hour session burning out and feeling upset about yourself because there's no progress but certainly consistency in practice is important to me and uh i probably do one to two every day if i'm preparing for a recording session or a gig i'll definitely put in more time sporadically leading up to the gig but one to two is healthy for me um, I can probably also chime in because I, I think I'd have actually a pretty different answer to Lucas because for me, I'm pretty inconsistent. I, I definitely don't have like a regular amount. It kind of comes in bursts, but when I do really get into it, it'll be long sessions. You know, I can sit and play for hours and hours. But for me, I'm less worried about sort of practicing a certain amount every day. And it's more about the quality of my attention when I'm practicing than it is about the, the amount of time spent. Because like I find at least I can I can quite easily waste an hour or two noodling on guitar and not really improving because I'm not addressing any issues. But if I spend 20 minutes like laser focused on solving a problem on the instrument, then that's like really beneficial. So I I, I try to think less about quantity and more about quality when it comes to practice. Like did I really pay attention to what I was doing and direct my practice towards achieving a goal? You know. And I also leave tons of time for just playing for fun because that's just as important. But I do kind of separate them a little bit in my mind. Sort of like, am I just playing to enjoy it or am I trying to fix a problem, you know? Yes, Gabriel? Yeah, I'll just jump in here quickly too. Yeah, like Lucas was saying, like right at the start of college, like you're playing your instrument all day, every day, and then you, you're going to go at home afterwards and practice some more. So it's like, eight hours in total or something but now like in the summer it's tough sometimes yeah like I'll, i'd like to get like an hour or two a day but sometimes it's not necessarily just practicing on my instrument as it is just maybe doing something else musically like i'm doing some like mixing now as well so it's not practicing on the drums but there's it's still something else uh that's involved with music even like just listening to like listening to music like some active listening just to get ideas and I find that's always really helpful too. And also like what Matt was saying, it's maybe always not about like the quantity. It's about the quality. Like you can, you can waste eight hours sometimes, or you can just do one really solid hour and, and that's way more productive than that eight, eight hours that you put in. So, so yeah, that's, that's what it is for me. Awesome. So Lucas, <laughs> how often do you practice? But he did, he did answer that already. I think he did. Oh, you answered already, Lucas? Yeah. I beg your pardon. All right. All well. <laughs> all right. All good. Yeah. All good. All right. Uh, Dwayne, I am going to ask you now to, to get ready to present your piece uh, that you brought for us. Are you ready, sir? I am. Let's all right. Just... So, guys, we are live and direct on the Music Hacks Network. You can find us on YouTube. Once you go to YouTube, and type in music hacks network then we'll be right there all right i'm gonna ask you please to hit that subscribe icon guys if you're here for the first time subscribe to the music hacks network and i'm gonna ask you to leave a like so that the youtube algorithm can push this video all over the world all right let's have mr Dwayne livy livingston at this time let me just use this opportunity to say um, welcome to everybody. I'm seeing Mrs. Anne-Marie Grant and Mrs. Elizabeth Jackson. Those are my past, past bosses at my Immaculate Prep where I used to teach. Um, really appreciate having you. So let me tell you what this is first. Um, it's not really a, it's not a piece that is um, tailored just to me. We chose a piece that everybody's going to play and do their own interpretation on. Right, so this song is called Stella by Starlight. And this is going to be my interpretation on the bass, and the rest, the, the other guys are going to do their own interpretation of this. Okay. All 
All right, your mic is muted, Dwayne. All right. Maestro, <laughs> Dwayne, as the saying says, when I grow up, bro, I want to become exactly like you. <laughs> aim, aim higher, man. Aim higher. <laughs> no, <laughs> no I, I think that's, that's the limit, bro. <laughs> no, 
That was awesome, man. Awesome. And the guys on YouTube, they are having a great time over there. All right. You guys are entertaining. All right. Robert says, very awesome. All right. Uh, what I wanted to do, Gabriel, I wanted to react to that, to, to do his plane. <laughs> Just blows me away every time. Like, I've never heard a bass play the way Dwayne plays the bass. Like, it's just, it's so good. Like his, his, his ideas, his musicality, like his, his scent, his feel, everything is just, it's just unreal. Like, yeah, I don't even know what else to say. <laughs> that was awesome, Dwayne. <laughs> Thanks. Man. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. All right, Dwayne. All right. So, Gabriel, you know, I'm going to take your piece next after a few questions. So get ready, Gabriel. All right. All right, let's take, um, guys on Zoom, I want you to indicate by raising your hand or raising your hands to ask a question and you can turn on your camera and your microphone as well and interact with the guys. It's, it's that time of the show when we have our Q&A, you can turn on your, your camera and your microphone, all right, when you're asking the questions, all right? Let's take this question from YouTube, Andre Goff, all right? Uh, is asking, what is the best scale to solo over blue in green? And I, I think he's directing that question directly to, to Dwayne. Uh, there's, uh, there's a, <laughs> there isn't a scale. There are so <laughs> many things to solo over blue and green. I mean, um, the thing about it is you have to, I normally tell people to think first about the card before they talk about the scale. Think about the card first, right? So. Mm -hmm. What, one of the things that you want to make sure you're doing when you're soloing is, especially when you're doing it by yourself, is that you want people to be able to hear where the song is without having backing track. So you're supposed, your solo should be telling people, oh, yeah, he's right here now. And the way to do that is to make sure you know the chord. So blue and green. <laughs> Right in here, I have the harmony, major 7, sharp 11. I normally tell people to play like a F major 7 over the B flat there. There's so much, I mean, you, you have the, the Lydian, you can play Lydian here. Right here, dominant 7, sharp 9 can play a simple dominant seven or you can play a, um, a flat uh, um, diminishing you can play um, the altered scale so it's the, it's, there's a lot if you're asking how to improvise over blue and green is there's a lot it, it, as a matter of fact to improvise over anything there's a lot that goes into that man it's, it's there's no one scale that you use it's just following the harmony and following uh you have scales and modes that goes in between that so what i just said what i'm trying to tell you is that there's a school of thought there and what songs are are you, you improvise over song awesome awesome doing all right let's take novel basie myers who is on zoom novel bless up yourself blessings blessings oh god Good, good, good. good. <laughs> <laughs> the real general Uncle Livy, what well, good? <laughs> Where's the one? Good day, man. My question tonight, Zin, is have you ever buckled up on a very technical and arduous piece where it's a bit impossible to manage? No one say you're the great maestro. <laughs> we didn't have to ask a question there. <laughs> of course, lots of times, man. I, I, lots of the songs I now play were difficult songs once I could manage. <laughs> but yeah, first, um, the thing about it is, I, I my attitude about music is that mm -hmm. what man has done, man can do. You know, so if it was sure. anybody before, I can do it too. So, but that attitude, I don't say anything that I can't play. I mean, I might not be able to play it now, but mm -hmm. um, I remember when I was in, at School of Music in Jamaica, the first time I heard Giant Steps, I was like, oh my goodness, you know, mm -hmm. you know I can, I mean, 
I know it now. You know, I can play the chords. I can solo over it. I can walk to it like it's yesterday's news. You know, uh, what the are idea you? is, I anything that is out there. I, that the first thing is, I make sure I got. I, I made sure I got a good understanding of what I was doing from the fundamental levels because music pretty mm -hmm. much is like building a house, and if you get the foundation right, everything else is like additions to the house. So if you get yeah. the fundamentals, the foundation right. The other additions, you know, because what what really is complexity? Complexity is just lots of simplicities put together. That's what mm -hmm. complexity is. So if you learn things from the fundamental levels properly, you will hear, you know, even over some chords, you have like slash chords or poly chords. You you play chords over over certain bass lines, so mm -hmm. like you can play a major seven arpeggio, a D flat major seven arpeggio over an E flat. That's a D flat seven sus four if you want to go as far up as the thirteenth. So you do uh, right. All that is is the D flat major seven arpeggio. Yeah. Um but if you didn't learn you learn these things from the fundamental levels, then when it gets down to that, then you won't be able to apply it. So learning it from That's the fundamental cool. levels. So mm -hmm. I, I don't have I don't really I don't have songs that I can't play. I might have songs that I can't play now. But, but when I hear, and that might be that might be dependent on I might not know the progression, uh, because mm -hmm. if it's lots of non-functional armor, then I have to listen to that a little bit and then get into it. But yeah. Okay, chief. Trust me. Um, listening to your presentation, I like I'm nearly jump out that chair in a bus. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome presentation. <laughs> Green, I want to also big up the other musician that is about to do their piece as well. Blessings, Green. Stand by for that, man. Out here from all of you guys. Yeah. All right. All right, sir, Chris. Blessings. Bless up, Novel. Bless up. All right, guys. I'm going to take one more question from YouTube, and then we'll have uh, Gabriel presenting his piece. All right, so Martin Carter wants to go back to um, the topic that we discussed about overthinking music. And he's asking, does practice help to absorb that stuff to not think when you're playing? Yes, to some extent. Uh, yes, mm. it does. Um, because when you, when you get comfortable, and the thing is, um, there's a level of overthinking that is necessary keep you practicing but where overthinking where, where you where overthinking is not supposed to happen is on stage because when you start overthinking on stage then you have a, fl a flood of information i mean the simpler you keep it even my final recital wasn't as sharp as i wanted it because i was overthinking you know i was my god this needs to go right and you, I, I was in charge of this whole show but the idea is um you're overthinking Overthinking the music sometimes will, will get in the way of it flowing naturally. But practice helps because if you know what you're doing, then you won't go on stage worrying, I wonder if I can, you know, I wonder if I can play and solo properly over this song. You know, you'll just know it will naturally come out. That's the thing about it. When you practice, the things that you are, the things that you can do naturally come out in your playing. You don't, I don't know, these guys don't spend time doing, oh, I'm trying to play the whole tone skill. Or, or, they practice for a length of time over progression and they get comfortable with uh, you know the lines and the patterns that can go over it when there's when it's time for them to play the lines just come out they're not thinking about skills at that time because they already did the work um to play those lines so when they get out when they get over the songs just to execute you know it's no time to think about skills just to play music yeah awesome awesome sir Gabriel, are you ready? Yeah, for sure. We'll give it a go here. All right. Let's do this. Gabriel. All right. So, yeah, I'll be playing the, the same song that uh, Dwayne was playing, Stella by Starlight. I'll be playing along with a, with a track from, from iReal Pro. So that's all right. I'd rather be playing with these musicians, but uh, this is what we've got for now. But, uh, yeah, so I'll be playing, like, 
some some jazz based stuff but i also like incorporating different grooves so i'm gonna try to do a little bit of that too and uh yeah hope you like it and uh, if you can't hear the track or anything just uh just give me a shout Master, the groove master, Gabriel, Gabriel, that was excellent, bro. I want Lucas to react to Gabriel's performance. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, man, I mean, I play with you live. I know what you're about. You play beautifully. Um, let's talk about how you're playing with a, with a backing track, all pre-recorded, but you're still bringing life to it, man. You're bringing a lot of life to it. You're bringing stylistically yourself to it, your own voice on the drums, which I love. It's it's nice to hear you and your creativity come out than, you know, squaring up and really doing the, the jazz thing. Because I know Stella gets pretty typecasted a lot of the time, but blow me away, man. I, I like how you play, and <laughs> we'll connect again soon. It's good to hear you. Thank you, yeah. Appreciate it, man. Awesome, awesome. Gabriel, we're blown away with that, bro. Trust me, that was awesome timing. Awesome everything, all right? Thank it's you. great to have you on the Music Hacks Network. <laughs> Thank you for having me, really. Awesome, awesome. All right, let's get back to some questions, all right? Guys on Zoom, man, I need some more questions. I need some more interaction from the participants on Zoom. You can turn on your, your cameras, as I said, and your microphones and interact with our guys, our guests from the Humber College. Most of you would have already be familiar with Duane. Duane spent a lot of years with us here in Jamaica. All right. I'm seeing all I'm seeing on YouTube right now is a lot of flames, guys. And you know, you know that, that emoji means that you guys are tearing down the Zoom right now with your performances. All right, excellent performances. All right. 
All right, uh, I am not seeing any more questions as yet. I think our Zoom participants are waiting a little bit, bit yeah. more. All right. Yeah, well, well. Who is this now? Robert, Robert, Robert. Oh, Robert. <laughs> yes, yes, Robert. I, 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 I asked the question earlier, so I wanted to give give other folks an opportunity um, to ask questions. So, Robert. So, yes, yeah. So, so here's my question to the drummer. Because are you I'm are not... you able to turn on your camera, Robert? Oh, yeah. Hold on one second. There. One second. Let's... Uh, what... Yes, man. We want to see who is Robert. Sure. Uh... So, you know, of course, uh, Dwayne is is a very good friend of mine. Of course. Uh, and uh, Dwayne, you have been doing an awesome job, man. I'm telling you, uh, I, I really appreciate the fact that, you know, just one second, guys, one second. Yes. All right, I'm coming yes, on. Ladies and gentlemen. Yes. There you, right. go. There you go, guys. There you go. <laughs> Fantastic. Welcome, Robert. Uh, <laughs> Here's my guitar, by the way. Of course, yeah. that, <laughs> great that, job, Robert. Listen, that, I was I was very nervous, man. Of course, I mean, listen to you know you know playing in front of these guys. Here, what do you expect, right? Yeah. So so here's my question uh, to the drummer. Uh, you have a tremendous responsibility. I mean, to keep timing for the the entire group, right? Uh, uh, do you feel greatly pressured uh, doing that? Is, is that something that go, runs through your mind while you're playing that, my God, if you just go off, I mean, that can really throw the entire band off. Is, uh, am I correct? Uh, yeah, like, yeah, that's a very good question, actually. Yeah, for sure. Like, time definitely is, like, the main responsibility of the drummer. But, like, playing with, like, uh, Matt, Lucas, and, and Wayne, like, they're all so, so great as well with, with knowing the time and like being able to like push and pull a little bit where it's all kind of like a shared responsibility with everybody. So maybe I can like lay the foundation, but if somebody wants to do something a little bit different or fill in the cracks and I know they're so good that they can feel that. And uh, yeah, that's, it's really, uh, it's basically, they say time isn't just the drummer's responsibility. For sure. You're mm -hmm. right. It's mainly, but uh, yeah, no, I'm confident in these guys that we can all just stay together and we, we we've locked in like when we have played together. So it's not too much of an issue when I, when I play with these guys. Right, right. But you do feel sometimes pressured. Sometimes a little bit. Like for the, <laughs> for the start of songs, it's like, okay, this has got to be, you yeah. know, tempo. Otherwise, people are looking back like, hey, that, that's not the right yeah. thing. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah, no, thank yeah. you. Awesome. Bless up, Robert. Yes, sir. All right. Thanks for tuning in, bro. All right. Let's take uh, Mr. Matt Greenwood at this time with his presentation. All right. So yeah, I guess I'll I'll play the same tune that uh, these guys have been playing, Stella by Starlight. Um, it's actually one of my favorite jazz standards to play. So hope you guys enjoy.
Oh my god. Oh my god. Matt, are you from this planet? <laughs> That's crazy stuff, man. That is crazy stuff. Gee. What what were you feeling? No, bro. Are you from planet Earth? <laughs> yes? I mean, I think so. <laughs> Young, so I, I, all right, before Robert Robert comes back, I want Dwayne to, to react to, to <laughs> Dwayne is a guitar player as well. So I want Dwayne to react to the Matt's playing. Not not after that time, man. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not a guitar player. <laughs> I I, what can I say? I mean Yeah. Oh my god. I mean this is this is the guy that made me uh Decide, you know what? Maybe I should give this guitar thing a break. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> return to it sometime later. <laughs> yes, man, this guy is just. There, there are no words oh to describe God. this man, man. The, the guy is. Yeah, you can all hear is. Um, you hear the level of reharmonization that the, he did with that song. It's an entirely different song when he played it. That, anybody <laughs> who knows Star, Stella by Starlight knows that this is a. That was an entirely different that was a different song from Stella by Starlight that we all knew mm -hmm. that we all know because I mean it it just chose to completely reharmonize it um, putting non-functional harmony at some places it's just ridiculous so this <laughs> guy is off the charts the, off the charts is not even I don't think it properly um Capsulates. Um, let me tell you honestly. I have run out of I've, I've run out of superlatives to describe this guy in the guitar. Well, I I, I think Jerome Tolo um, might sum it up on YouTube. He says Matt just cured cancer. <laughs> <laughs> he just did. He just did. Jerome, he just did, man. <laughs> oh, that that was amazing, bro. Amazing, Matt. Amazing. All right. I appreciate everyone. You're too kind. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, Matt, how, how, how do you approach something like that? What do you think of when you're approaching a tune like that to sort of reharmonize it like that? What, what do you think yeah, of? That's a great question. So similar to what uh, Dwayne talked about earlier with the question about practicing and um, overthinking, like while I'm playing is not really the time for me to be thinking about the the inner workings of it. I just play whatever feels right instinctively. But uh, mm -hmm. the only reason I can kind of do that to a certain level is because of all the time spent thinking about it and working it out in excruciating detail. You know what I mean? Like I, I really, I'm quite passionate about, you know, music theory and I like knowing how music works. So I really like to sit and figure out how things work on my instrument. And like when it comes to I mean, a lot of what I was doing there was more to do with chord voicings than sort of melodic concepts. So maybe a, a good point to start with, with how I would like, you know, develop that kind of concept is just mapping out my instrument and, you know, knowing many, many ways to play the same chord. So for instance, you know, C major seven could be here, but I could play it a million different places. Like, You know what I mean? And, and having that kind of vocabulary on your instrument where you've mapped it out frees you up to be a lot more spontaneous when you're playing, you know, chord melody things. And in terms of uh, what Dwayne said mm -hmm. about reharmonization, um, I try to be a bit sneaky with <laughs> chords and things where I, I like to reharmonize things in a way that would still work if someone was playing the original harmony with me. So I try not to throw anything in that's incompatible with what's already there just sort of choosing to negate certain notes from the original chords and add certain ones you end up left with a different color for instance if you take a a three-part chord like a triad with three notes in it like a major chord and play so c e and g you can keep adding notes to it and extending it to make it a bigger chord voicing until it's got like you know five notes in it for example like something like What's a good example? Something like this, like, like I've added a 13th in there and the major 7th. But then if I just took some of those notes out and I just kept like three of them, for example, but left out maybe the original three that were there, I've got just the extensions without the, the base of the chord that I built them on top of. 
So if I play it by myself, it'll sound like a completely different chord. But if someone else was playing with me and played the original one, they would still gel. They'd be compatible. So that's how I arrive at some of the chord substitutions, is trying to make it compatible with the original chords. And on the odd occasion, I'll just throw something in just to be cheeky that really doesn't uh, work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Awesome stuff, Matt. All right. So if you like that performance so far, or those performances from Dwayne, from Gabriel, and from Matt so far, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe to the Music Hacks Network. All right. This time we are going to ask Linden to come with his uh, question. Uh, Linden. Yes, I'm here, Chris. How are you? All right. Um, are you, are you able to turn on your camera? No, not at the moment. All right, fine. Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, greetings, gentlemen. Um, it's just sitting here listening to you guys as um, really, really it, it's really doing something on the inside, and I must commend you. Um, gentlemen because you know listening to people who who are really good at aircraft i was just even saying in a um in a in a channel with um livy that just listening to you guys it's the the knowledge that you guys have along with you know being so in tune with the instrument it it makes it makes me it just makes me it's for, for, for that um, for me it seems so far and that's 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 just commending, uh, really um, to commend, um, commend you guys. Um, so I guess my first, um, hopefully last question is, um, I'm, a, I'm a beginner bass player. I, I do have um, access to Livy um, in sort of a direct sense, but not you know, in close proximity. In terms of you know, dealing with the ups and downs of a, being a beginner player, whether it be on the guitar, on the um, on the um, the bass, which I'm learning. How how do you, how do you tackle those ups and downs? How do you overcome like the frustrations, the you know the um, not understanding certain concepts, um, and and all of that. You see, when I just started, uh, when I went. Um... Yeah, yeah. You see, Jerome and those guys on, who asked questions on the line a while ago, they are my classmates from Medna Mali College School of Music. He's a fabulous piano player. Um, and those guys can tell you about um, the days when we used to have class with Maurice Garden, teacher at school. And when I just started playing bass because when I went to School of Music, oh, there's another guy that's in the chat. And you might have heard Chris introduce him, Donald Loire. That was the first guy I ever saw play bass. I was telling you, you guys need to go check him out. Donaloa, right? Donaloa.com. Uh, that guy, I went to School of Music and I saw him play bass the first time. And I went there thinking I was a musician, you know. I, I, would, I, thought, that I thought I was a bass player until I saw Donald play. And I realized I wasn't a musician at all. And then, um, but here's what happened. I, I got the bass and Maurice Garden gave me some finger exercises to practice and some skills. And let me tell you. At one point, my fingers burned so much, and <laughs> my hands hurt so much, I just put the bass down. I almost cried. I put the bass down in my bed and said, you know what, I don't think I'm going to do this thing. I don't think I'm going to do it. And, but I think, I guess, I guess my love for the music won over. And I took it up and soldiered on to all that difficulty. And over time, and I'm, I'm not talking about years, I'm talking about maybe some weeks, I was realizing that these fingers didn't hurt anymore. They became callous to the instrument, and then my f my my uh, my left hand got used to get being stretched. So, after a while, it became easy, and I, I realized that the more you practice, the easier it becomes. But I'm telling you, one mm -hmm. thing you have to have, and I don't, I can't tell anybody how to have it because the thing is, a part of um, you have to you have to love the craft. If you don't love music, there's a chance you won't do well in it. Because it, it's, it's my love for music that drove me to practice all the time, even when it was hurting. 
So I, I pushed past the pain in the wrist because sometimes I used to have to wear wrist support. So I pushed past the pain here and just um, practice anyway. If you can do that, practice not just because you feel like doing it. Practice because you know it's necessary to practice. Um, you'll you'll start getting over the frustration. I still feel frustrated too. I, 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 I play, you know, I still feel a, a lot frustrated. Like right now, I don't like how I sound now. I I don't like how I sound now. I want to be better. At it. <laughs> I kind of, you know, I, I use my lessons oh, from then to inspire me to do stuff now. Yeah. Mm. You don't like what you saw no doing. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. It's not weird. Oh, you know. Yeah. See, oh my God, Chris. Oh, and it, it, it's when it's when musicians like this speak like that. It it, it really chuckles me because I'm at the yes. point where I I I I want to play like on the level he's playing, and he's saying that he's not he he's not at a certain level. So that that worries me. <laughs> no, 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 I, but let, let me ease the worry because what I'm trying to say is. <clears throat> Uh, there's there's never going to be a level that you're going to be um that you're not going to at least find some level i've I've seen some guys play that literally depressed me <laughs> i have you guys seen jacob collier i've seen that guy play sometimes yes we have yes yes, <laughs> yes. Like so i'm saying <clears throat> there are levels and there are levels you just have to look at each step as it, you, you see look at a step you know you have one and two three you know, incremental. Uh, that's what a step is. It's incremental. You know, you have one, then you have two, then you have three. At each tier of those, uh, of that step, you know, you're you're gonna have different kinds of challenges. You know, when you're starting as the beginner, you have the challenge of the burn finger, pain in your wrist, and those kind of things. Then you move to the second tier. You may have a different challenge, and it's going to be equally frustrating. Equally as frustrating. Um. But you just have to take the lessons of the first, and if you don't have the first lesson, then that's where you're going to be in trouble. You have you have to be you have to pass that first stage, where you conquer um, the pain and the, the stress of getting your fingers to stretch out and those kind of things. Once you pass that first stage, you can learn. You can use that lesson to go to the second stage, the third stage, the fourth stage, and yeah. And always know that music is never good. It's not a destination. It is a journey. It's going to from the day. The, you're, until you die, it's going to be a journey. It's, you're, not, you're never going to fully master it. You have to understand that. It's, it can't just be a statement. It has to be a reality. It's a reality for me. Mm -hmm. I, I will never ever master this thing. I'm just doing the best I can to better myself each day. That's it. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Uh, we have Fabian. Somerville and we also have Dwight Summers. Um, you guys want to ask a question? Dwight, you're not ready? Not really, no. Um, no, um, I used to listen when I met Livy, no Livy, when he was going um school of music. Well, every time we have final year show, we always have, you know, always always be there. Just to hear Livy playing, you know, because sometimes we hear Livy playing song like um, the next um, Victor. <laughs> yes, he was like he was like the next Victor, you know, and he inspired me to play bass. Also, I I, I play bass, um, but I'm a really a drummer, you know. But as Livy said, it take practice, you know, to to be where where um where hard. Um, for me, no, I. I don't get a chance to practice because I have a son there. Every time I take out the bass, he's here. If I take out my drumstick, he's still there. When I'm at church playing the keyboard, he's right there. So, you know, I don't get no chance to, <laughs> to play the way I want to. Uh, but, awesome. you know, Livy Liv, Liv, Liv is like, you know, like a brother. You know, yeah. so the last time I met him before I left where I you know, Mega Mark. Mm. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, man. Yes, but man. I, I, I still practice now and then when I get a chance, though. All right. Uh, bless up, bless up, Dwight. Uh, Fabian.
Your mic is muted. Can you hear me now? Microphone check, one, two, three. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, as, I, as I was saying, you know, I came on very late. But I guess since you said question, my question would have been, why is it that uh, most musicians don't like the way they sound? They're always trying to sound like somebody else who has been always considered established. Why is it wrong with your sound at all? Because even with myself, sometimes I play an instrument. Yeah, some people say, yo, that more has all like, you know, you change your amber tour, you change whatever, to get that sound there. Why? Um, I pretty much sound like myself right now. But here's it, here's it. <laughs> there, you can, there's a, there are different levels of yourself. Um, I, um, for example, there are certain standards that I most, I, I consider a fluent musician to be on, regardless of who you sound like. Whether you sound like Marcus Miller, Victor Wood, now you sound like yourself. There's a certain level that you have to be at. So that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about um, fluency. Um, it's not about a sound. I, I, I kind of know what I am already and what I like to play. I, and I, I know how um, the way I tend to play notes. I know the things that make me me. That's one very, it's a, it took a very long time for me to discover that. But I, I, knew, I know the things about my playing that makes, me, makes it my playing. I know certain ways I bend the strings or certain ways I pull the notes off to where I want to go. It's me. I know it's me. As much as I have influences from Marcus Miller, Victor Wood, and those guys. But there's a certain level that you have to play at regardless of if it's you or not. There's a certain mm -hmm. level that's... Uh, there's a certain level of fluency. And you know, these guys talk about confidence. It, confidence comes with that level of fluency. And that's what I'm talking about. When I have that level of fluency, being me is easier. Yeah. All right. Awesome. All right. Uh, respect, Fabian. Um, we're going to take one final question from our live stream on YouTube, and then we're going to ask Lucas to bring our live stream on YouTube to a close with his interpretation of Stella by Starlight. But let us state this question that was not answered on YouTube. Uh, I think it was Jerome. Jerome Tolo would like each of you to tell him who are your main influences. I know you guys have, have said a few of these persons along the way, but I wanted to get in real deep now. Who do you actually look to for motivation? All right, let's take um, Gabriel first. Yeah, so for me, like I come from like a, a classic rock background. So like some of the first drummers that I was listening to were like, John Bonham, uh, Jeff Beccaro and those guys. And, but I like my drum teacher was, was really great too. And he introduced me to a whole bunch of other drummers like, uh, like, uh, Dad and Dave Weckl and Vinnie Colaiuta and then, uh, Horacio Hernandez from Cuba. He's a phenomenal drummer. I've got the chance to meet him. So just really a wide range of styles. Also David Garibaldi from uh, tower of power. So just, those are some of my main influences. Awesome. Awesome. All right, all right, Matt. Start right on the spot. There are probably way too many to list, but um, I also I kind of started with rock music, so there's a part of me that's still always really heavily influenced by guys like Steve Vai and Jeff Beck. But then more recently, um, some of my absolute favorites, more in the jazz world, are like um, Bill Frizzell, Jonathan Kreisberg, Adam Rogers, Gilad Hexelman, Julian Lage. There's so many I could go on for ages, but another thing that's been a really big part of my uh, development recently on guitar is drawing influence from classical composers and um, listening to like string quartet music and stuff I like Bella Bartok and Stravinsky, Debussy, Bach, all those guys like you can learn so much about just music and melody and harmony and it all applies to whatever genre you're into. If you're playing jazz or rock or whatever, there's something you can learn from sort of all the great old music from all around the world. 
And uh, the other thing is um, the music where I grew up in Zimbabwe. The, there's Shana Mbira music. And I also uh, play the Mbira a bit. And that definitely was a big influence. So, yeah, lots of different places. Uh, yeah, I mean, if we're talking influence, uh, for many, many years, uh, there's a few saxophone players that have stuck with me, uh, particularly the absolutely magical stylings of uh, Chris Potter and uh, the taste and musicianship of Bob Reynolds. Those two have been favorites for as long as I can remember, and I've been trying to not emulate, but take away as much as I can as their musicianship and try to create more for myself but definitely Chris Potter and Bob Reynolds for me otherwise I'm um, definitely influenced by everyone I play with all the members you see today insane musicians absolutely wonderful musical voices and uh, there's something to take away from everyone you play with so I definitely find inspiration from day to day as well as in writing and poetry and in other forms of art I'm sure a lot of us here I know Matt as well as into interdisciplinary art so making music from paintings or with dance and stuff so yeah i guess influences chris potter bob reynolds as well as a plethora of other things and the musicians i play with every day awesome awesome lucas and while you get ready to do the final piece for tonight uh duane you would like to respond to that question Okay, well, for the people in Jamaica, know immediately that I, I am very heavily influenced by Victor Wooten, very heavily influenced by well, let me leave Marcus Miller for last. But I'm very heavily influenced by Victor Wooten and Jaco Pastorius, um, and also John Patitusi. I I used to listen to him a lot in the in my early days of school of music, Gotta Match and Spain and those songs. I used to, uh, I think I did Victor Wooten, what's the name of that? Cherokees. I don't know if anybody knows Victor Wooten's version of Cherokee um, from, yeah, from the album What It Is. I did that for my final year show at the Manicali, so you know I'm, I was very heavily influenced there. Um, in in the, in the these days, I'm mostly influenced by two bass players. Um, Adrian Furo, his, well, his, his name is spelled Ferrod, but it's Furo really. And um, Marcus Miller. Marcus Miller is one of the most um, complete bass player musicians that I know. And I also practice a lot of saxophone. Um, and I, I, used, I used to love, I, listen, I love listening to Alex, Alex Akan. That's his name from Marcus Miller's band. He's ridiculous. Um, I, li I, listen, I love listening to Miles Davis's old album, like, what, um, so what? I remember I used to listen to So What and practice all of those saxophone lines. I used to practice those lines on the bass. And, yeah. um, these guys are, are now my modern influences. Trust me. You, who can see Matt play and not be in inspired? Who can see Lucas play like that and not be inspired? Seriously. So, I have a wide range of inspiration right now yeah. awesome awesome guys awesome all right there you have it ladies and gentlemen or viewers and subscribers on youtube tonight's uh showing was about Dwayne livingston and friends and these guys they attend the humber college in all the way in Canada. All right, I'm gonna ask you to check them out. All right, uh, I, I think we need to take your, your social guys. Uh, where can we find you on social media, Gabriel? Uh, for me, just it's just my name really on on Facebook, I guess, and uh, and Instagram, mm -hmm. that's, that's about all. And, and YouTube as well, yeah. I've got some some stuff up on YouTube. So yeah, just just my name, Gabriel J. Maria. Okay. Awesome, bro. All right, Matt. Uh, yeah, same here. Um, just on Instagram and Facebook, and it's my 
full name though, which is Matt Austin Greenwood. I could put the link in the Zoom maybe if that helps. Awesome, sure. Cool. All right, uh, Livy. Yeah. So Instagram Livy Basic Four. Um, my pa my Facebook artist page Dwayne Livingston Music, and YouTube Livy mm -hmm. Basic. All right. Awesome. Cool. All right, um, Lucas. Uh, yeah, so all my socials are by my name. My Instagram is uh, Lucas Dubovic Music. You can find me on Instagram. You can find me on Facebook by my name. And you can find me on Twitter by my name. Awesome. All right, guys. I'm going to ask you, please, just so if you can have a chance to so type that in the chat so persons can copy it and then reach out to you. So thank you very much, guys, for joining this live stream. All right. If you are here for the first time, you can find us on YouTube. Just type music hacks network and you can find us just give us a subscription all right and help us to grow this amazing platform all right all of this is free free information that you can use to develop yourself all right persons on zoom please do not leave i think we're gonna um have a little five minutes talk with the guys before we close but to bring our youtube Live stream to a, a close. We're going to take the great saxophonist himself, uh, Mr. <laughs> Lucas Devoic. All right. Oh, okay. Sorry, am I having issues with my mic? <laughs> Amazing, amazing, Lucas. Before we go, Matt, just react to Lucas as we take the show to an end. Yeah, I mean, uh, as you can hear, he can barely play the saxophone. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. No, Lucas <laughs> is really like one of the best players I know. So, I mean, every time I hear him play, it's, it's just something else. So, he was, um, he started at the school here one year before I did. 
So when I got here in my first year and I heard him playing as a second year student, it just kind of blew my mind. And I was like, oh my goodness, that's, that's how good I need to try and get. And <laughs> it was really cool to, to meet people like around my age who were playing at that level. Um, it's just crazy. So, and I mean, uh, Lucas and I play together all the time. So it's sort of, I guess, pretty used to how, how I'm pretty used to how he plays and it's sort of like just sounds really familiar now for me and like in a good way where I, it's like uh well it's like you're someone you're friends with and you know their personality sort of musically and as a person so it's cool it's always fun to hear Lucas play awesome awesome Duane thank you sir thank you for pleasure, putting bro. these guys on. together for this show <laughs> it's a pleasure it's a awesome a, a, absolute pleasure all right, Lucas, thank you, sir. Gabriel, thank you. Thank Matt, thank you, sir. <laughs>